<laughs> well, first, I want to let you know in the chat right now, uh, we've got people who live in New Haven, have lived in New Haven, studied in New Haven, are telling us all their favorite places. People who grew up in Fairfield in the 70s, that's John, and would go to Sally's for the White Clam Pizza. People who were 20 minutes away. Uh, lots of people who have plenty of experience with it. So this is awesome. And also to let everybody know, this is being recorded. So I'll post it on my YouTube channel. You'll be able to access it just the same as two weeks ago, we had Peter Regis. That video will be posted this Friday. Uh, we want this information to be out so people have access to it because this is, as Colin just said, it's not known information. Colin, I know for most people, new, it's almost a surprise when they hear that New Haven, Connecticut is even a famous pizza city. So for us to be digging so deep now, is sort of like beyond what a lot of people hear. Why do you think New Haven is sort of the like secret famous pizza city of America? Well, secret's getting out, but um, I think it's because we're New York City's little nephew, you know, in a way. Um, New York is, so, is such a huge metropolitan area, big city, and we're just a little city on the, literally the outskirts of the metropolitan area. So in so many ways, we get overshadowed by Boston and New York and bigger cities that are nearby. Connecticut, you know, it's one of the smallest states. Um, we don't have any like major league teams, um, but we do have major league pizza players. I'll put it out there like that. And I think that's, you know, when people talk about pizza cities, they think of the big cities. So Chicago and New York, um, to name a couple, you know, in the States. And now we know about Detroit and people talk about many others. So I think the idea is that even smaller cities can create their own sort of legacy. Um, and I think that's what New Haven's done. Well, especially recently where you mentioned Detroit and I think places like Detroit and like New Haven become so popular now because of social media. So, I mean, even 20 years ago, people knew that New Haven is famous for pizza, but even today, I think you ask some people from, you know, like outside of the Northeast, and it's a bit of a surprise. Uh, even though, like you just said, the secret's getting out. Absolutely. I mean, shouldn't be a secret because New Haven has been on, uh, New Haven pizzerias have been on these top 10 lists uh, for the past decade at least. Yeah. I'm talking yeah. about and the, the top 101 just came out from the Daily Meal. And I think Connecticut had six of the top 101. I think it was six. And then Peace um, Pizzeria in Chicago is number 10. Um, you know, which is New Haven style. It's a New Haven guy, Billy Jacobs, and um, uh, you know, Beats Shoals in Portland, Oregon, got on there again. I think what's what's happening, and the, I know the report. There's many different lists, but there it seems like New Haven's constantly on the list, and the famous players are Sally's, Peppy's, and and Modern. Um, and then there's these other underdog players that are coming up, like Zupardi's and you know whoever else. So I think that there are levels of this legacy. There's people who've heard of New Haven because of Yale or, you know, Winchester rifles. And then there's people who've heard of it because of pizza, but they may not have heard of, they may, they may have only heard of three pizzerias, you know, that's an interesting. I always find it interesting because we have this thing where we, we talk about New Haven as a style, but to me, a style needs to have a bunch of pizzerias doing something similar. That's kind of specific to that region. And if you look at New Haven today, yeah, it's only a small handful of places. But I know I've read in your books, uh, there's all these pizzerias that I had never heard about that were just, they've been gone for 40 years or, or longer. So they're just not part of, of my perception of New Haven. Uh, at its peak, how many pizzerias were there in New Haven? And what was that peak period? Okay, interesting question. Um, so... New Haven as a city, you know, being the center of its region, peaked in population in 1950 with about 170,000 people. Um, its metro area is still growing. So we have almost a million people metro. Um, so if I was gonna tell you how many, you know, city proper, when we had the most pizzas in, in New Haven, it's probably, it's, you know, we're near it um, now. I mean, it's gonna be a few hundred. Um, in the city itself. And then 
uh, in the metro area, there's there's definitely at least there's got to be close to a thousand. I mean, there's so many pizzerias in this area. Uh, it's it's crazy. There's a lot of choice. <laughs> yeah, there is. So uh, I'm assuming that, and it's more than assuming because I've read the books, but I'm assuming that uh, when pizza came into New Haven, it was around the same time that it hit other metropolitan areas like Boston and New York and uh, places like that. When do you see this influx of pizzerias start to pop up in the, in the city or, or was it even in the city? Was it beyond the city? Well, so in the beginning, I mean, the pizza followed the immigrants. So it was largely in those industrial neighborhoods that we find early pizzerias here in New Haven. And it was, it was likely in the late 1800s, early 1900s that we see that evidence. We see it in many cities around the East Coast um, where Italian immigrants came to. So New Haven follows that trend. And, but it's, I would call it the boom of pizzerias in New Haven, which was a, you know, a sort of one after the next, was it, right after the repeal of prohibition uh, in 1933, and a whole bunch of pizzerias opened to the point where about by 1940, New Haven had about 40 pizzerias. Wow. And it's a little bit earlier than the boom in the rest of the country, which was about 1950 to 60. And, th and there was a lot of reasons for that. Um, but I think New Haven's boom was, you know, beer and college students and the most Italian immigrants of any city per capita. Uh, and and then the region. I mean, our region was full of Italian farmers. So in all these farming communities, you'd have the local baker also made pizza. And it became very, very common all around New Haven, you know, not just in New Haven, but also in the farming areas. Now, w when you say uh, largest, like a huge population from Italy, well, is there a specific region of Italy that they're from? Or is there kind of a dispersion uh, amount uh, among a certain... Part. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I did, I have some of this stuff in the presentation. Should I? Oh, yeah. I want to. Do you think I, I should do it? Dive in <laughs> I could do it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to start sharing. Is that good? Yeah, please go okay. for it. And everybody, if you have questions, bring them up. And Colin, I'll keep my eye on the chat and I'll throw the questions your way. So don't let yourself get distracted by that. Chat. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, Okay, so oh, can everyone I was gonna get see so it? hungry just looking at this? Oh, I'm so sorry. Did I just, oh man. <laughs> yeah, so you know, this is, uh, for those who don't know, this is a quintessential New Haven, what we call abits. And I wanna try to get everybody to understand what that word is by the end of this talk. But, um, so this, this is a New Haven pie. We call it a tomato pie, abits. Um, that's a plain New Haven. These terms are all so colloquial. Uh, plain does not mean mozzarella. So what you're looking at is basically a tomato pie with, it's just like tomato sauce, you know, and it's, it's got grated cheese on it. So grated uh, pecorino, Romano. Is it, hey, Colin, sorry to yeah. interrupt you right on the first slide, but is it a cooked sauce or is it just raw tomato? It's raw when it goes on the dough and then it gets cooked with, it's basically crushed tomatoes. Yeah. Gotcha. So, I'm just trying to see if like when you're saying it's just got sauce and cheese on it, yeah. I'm thinking way like, like a, is it, to me, it's a sauce if it's already been cooked. Yeah. If it's just going on raw, in my mind, it's just tomato. It's just tomato. So, I mean, I think some people might think uh, fresh tomato. And so I'm, uh, you know, I'll call it sauce. Some people call it gravy. Um, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> not here in New Haven. Call it whatever so, you want. I just want to yeah. I love that you like to get into the detail because I think there's so much detail here. And, and Scott, we could literally have like an entire day of just – talking pizza. So um, I'm going to move. Ready? Here we go. That's my sign to shut up. Yeah, go for no, it. No, no, I love it. I just, I want to answer every question. Um, okay, let's see if I can do this. I have to share the screen, I think. Yeah, we, I see it. Okay. It's great. So um, this is a little uh, mixture of headlines from different stories, um, explaining a little bit to the audience about how New Haven became known for pizza starting in probably in the 1950s. Um, some of the older black and white ads, people who never heard of Yale, No Elm City, which is our nickname for its pizza pie. That, that's a 1953 ad. Um, there's an Italian, um, see, I, can you see my cursor? I can, yeah. Cool. So there's an Italian, you know, like, uh, 
article from a paper saying like, what the best pizzas in New Haven? That's crazy. So 101 best pizzas. And the idea is that this is really kind of how, this is kind of how I saw uh, collecting a worldview of New Haven, you know, not from a, a local's perspective, but may, maybe from somebody who traveled time and said, wow, we do know New Haven because it's been talked about for years for, you know, 60, 70 years. Um, so that's, that's just an explanation of that. We also have lines that are pizzerias. So the famous pizzerias, I, I mentioned three of them, Pepe's, Sally's, and Modern. Those are what we call the big three. Um, I'll add zoo parties in as like the, the big four, because I think from a historical perspective, they're right there. And from a, from a taste perspective as well. Um, and it just, it shows that there's lines. We, this is a thing that's normal. It's normal to see lines. So that's a phenomenon. And you were just talking about where in Italy did they come from, Scott? So I wanted to show you this. <laughs> um, this is a, a, a very useful map. It shows um, Italy in the time period of 1876 to 1900 and 1901 to 1915. And the colors represent the red, the dark red and the purple, whatever color it is on your screen, um, represent the most Italian emigration during those time periods. And the green and yellow means the least, or sorry, the green means the least. So we, what, the area we're gonna be looking at is Campania. And you can see that in 1876 to 1900, there was 520,000 people that left Campania. And then nearly a million left during the next uh, 15 year time period. And that's the region where people came from mostly to New Haven. They also came from Sicily, Calabria, uh, Puglia, uh, Abruzzi, uh, Abruzzo, Marche, um, and, and, all, and a few from Veneto. So, but most of them came from Campania and this little, little map that was made by our Italian communities, we have these vestige Italian societies that are from particular towns. And these are highlighted here. Um, so our sister city, which has the most uh, people from that city is Amalfi. And it's in Campania, it's, it's just south of Napoli, it's just north of, or west of uh, Salerno. And these are all these little cities and are right around Amalfi. Atrani is literally next to it. Um, Minori is another two towns over and, um, you know, um, Ca uh, Castellamar de Stabia is, um, is another one. So these are all these different towns, all from Campania, and it represents a large uh, community of, of those Italians. Um, this is a view of, of Minori, uh, excuse me, Maiori, um, which is another large you know, village city that a lot of Italians came to New Haven from. A lot of the Pizzioli who lit, once lived in this town came to New Haven. So there is this kind of amazing connection today to Italy and New Haven. Uh, specifically to this region. People travel back and forth, they share the same families and holidays, and you'll see a lot of those connections with, with different family members and units. Um, so I'm gonna skip over New York because Peter Regas did an amazing job explaining um, some of the early pizza history in New York, and there's so much more to say on that. But pretend that all the Italians made it made it to Ellis Island or, or the, you know, whatever the immigrant port was at the time. And from right from Ellis Island or, or wherever it was, they got on this boat um, and others. Uh, Richard Peck was a boat that sailed Long Island Sound. So it would go from uh, New York City to New Haven and other sites, Long Island and Bridgeport and wherever. And they, this is where most of the immigrants arrived in New Haven uh, at the harbor from directly off the boat from New York. So they didn't settle in New York necessarily. They just, they got to Ellis Island and they entered and then they already had their papers designated to go to New Haven. And the reason why, and here's New Haven in 1879, um, it's showing you a little graphic, but the reason why is because of factories. And we're gonna look at those quickly. There's some you know factory buildings here, but this is when Italians started coming to New Haven around this time. It looked just like this. It was sepia. <laughs> um, no, uh, so you got the harbor down below. So that represents this kind of trade and and you know access. You have railroads. That was a big employer. Um, you can see rocks in the background. I actually live right there. There's my house. It's right <laughs> there. Um,
but you can see these rocks quarrying was a big job for Italians too in the area. So um, that's, that's why Italians came to New Haven. They came for jobs. You know, this is amazing because, oh wait, I don't want to interrupt you. Oh. I, I just feel like seeing that picture yeah. of, you know, an image of Naples at that same time looks almost identical. Oh, amazing. I love it. You know what I mean? Like the Bay, high population leading into the mountains with less population. Yeah. Like this is our Vesuvius. We call it West Rock. <laughs> um, we have another one, East Rock. But so this is a 1924 view, kind of looking at the same perspective, but you can kind of see how industrialized the city was getting. It was a lot like parts of Brooklyn um, and other sections of New York. It was very, it was very dense. And it was a, it was where immigrants came to. It's where, you know, uh, Americans came to to get jobs, and it was a, a very important city at one time. Still is. Uh, the factories include that hired Italians include the Strauss Adler Company, uh, one of the largest corset companies in the world uh, at the time. The L Candy Rubber Works was a major employer of Italians. This was probably one of the first factories that Italians worked at, um, making uh, Charles Goodyear's patented rubber. He patented it in New Haven. The Winchester Repeating Arms, that was our largest factory, made rifles, ammunition, roller skates, you name it. Um, and they hired during wartime 20 to 30,000 people. So it was a huge employer um, and they hired a lot of Italians. In fact, in this image, there was a, later on, there would be a pizzeria located right where my cursor is moving. You can see that. So just little tidbits there. The, the, the other big factory, the big one that we're, that's important is the Sargent Manufacturing. It was a hardware company. This is in 1902. Um, pre the president was visiting here. I think it was Roosevelt. And um, this is just showing how intense factory life was. And Sargent was run by this guy, J.B. Sargent. And then he married a, a second wife in 1878, Italian-born Florence von Kerrigan. She was born outside of Florence, hence her name, grew up in Boston, came to New Haven um, as a young woman and married this man to help raise his kids. And we have proof in 1880 that at, right after they got married that she wrote a letter to her husband um, explaining how to say, if you don't show up for your job, um, you'll be fired in Italian. So they had plenty of Italians working there at the time and they were already sending them messages. You found this letter? I found a uh, history of the letter, and I know I can. I know where the letter is. It sits in an archive. Um, so I'm not showing it now. That's for the. <laughs> um, and then this is showing a 1940 view of uh, one of New Haven's very strong Italian neighborhoods. This is the Grand Avenue district. Straight through the street is Grand Avenue. Uh, factory. There was a clock company here. Um, gasometer. We don't talk about that. Railroad tracks. And this is the border between the East Rock neighborhood where Modern Abits now sits and Worcester Square neighborhood, which is just below the screen. Um, and it shows the, again, the density. Um, and it's kind of where a lot of our cat characters and, and sort of locations are gonna be in this talk. Um, we're actually, so we're gonna zoom in to, if you look at my cursor, right side of the screen, past the church on the right, right here, we're zooming in, there's a, this is, we're getting to details now. So where did, where did pizza start in New Haven? I think that was a big question. Um, and I determined that the best I could is that the, one of the earliest places that pizza started was a, a bake house. As you can see, it's a, it's a bakery. It was behind a house that had also had a bakery in its basement. And this bakery had many, many different bakers working there, Italian bakers starting in 1892. And it was soon after the first uh, bakers were, were listed in the New Haven uh, records. So this is clearly a very, this was a very important site for early Italian bakers and, and so, and, and it kept going. And I think the, what you're looking at, if you don't know, um, these are Sanborn maps. This one's from 1901. They are insurance atlases. Um, the uh, pink is brick buildings. The yellow is wood frame buildings. Green is actually a metal frame building. Uh, and then, you know, what you're looking at here is basically you can see it says oven. That's where the oven was, it was huge. Now, when you think of an oven at a pizzeria today, you probably think of something that's much smaller, a steel deck oven or, you know, one of those beehive ovens that are, they don't take up a ton of room. This is a massive oven, um, likely 
the size of what we now see at Frank Pepe's. It would be over 14 feet in, in at least one dimension. So uh, they're designed to, to cook a lot of bread. Um, that's actually what they would have been for bread. So we've learned about this. I learned a lot about this site. Um, this is a 1950 view of this little dead end street. Um, this is Donnelly Place. It stops right here. There's tenements all over it. Um, and this is all gone now. So we, it's all through kind of archive imaging and stuff. But this is the old bakehouse that I'm circling with my cursor. Um, you can see an opening that would have been an entry for a carriage or um, for access to get into the building. And there was even a, a, a residence above. And if you can only imagine that this was a site where many, many pizzas and, and bread breads, I should say, or loaves would have been uh, passed through um, by a carriage and then later truck. So you, this, this is, yeah. This, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this, this location was, when were they making pizza? So we're going to find that out. Um, it's, there's an unknown. And then we find out at definitely by a certain date, um, they're making pizza. But I'll, I'm going to explain that, Scott. Um, I have a little, I did a little timeline to kind of explain how we don't know everything yet. We, well, we may never know everything, but um, we do know that bakers who started as bakers opened pizzerias, and I'll have a list to show you. Okay. Um, so one of the earliest uh, or earlier one is uh, this gentleman here. His name was uh, Antonio Yaccarino and his son. <laughs> Can you imagine doing that work? This is about 1905, 1906. Um, you can see that they had a, a business called Ponzo and Yaccarino. They were Italian bakers. Um, this would have been your traditional bread delivery uh, carriage. So they were sending bread around in a wagon. That was very common then. Uh, bread delivery was, it was generally how you would do it. You send it to restaurants, you send it to homes. Um, large families, you know, would, would buy a bunch of bread. So that was, this was very common for any kind of baker. Um, we also understand that a vet, certain pizzerias started out delivering in these kind of wagons. I'm not going to say that this gentleman was a pizzeria or making pizza, but um, this is sort of an example. So this is a list um, never seen before of the bakers at 14 Donnelly Place, which was the address of that bakery. On the left, you're going to see a list of all the bakers in timeline, in sequence, and on the right, stretched or you're going to see when we have proof that they opened a pizzeria. So in between these times, the one thing I will mention is that they had, many of these guys had bakeries in other places where we know they baked. We just don't know what they baked. So there's many times you can make assumptions that if Angelo Gentile, and in New Haven we would now say Gentile, um, Angelo Gentile uh, started baking in 1896 on this site, and in 1931, he opened up a pizzeria and his children had pizzerias eventually. We may be able to deduce that he knew how to make pizza earlier on and could have been making pizza. Um, another character we're gonna learn about is Ignazio Camposano. Um, he started baking here in 1916 and continued and had other bakeries and finally had a, a traditional storefront bakery in 1924 called Camposano's Abitz. Frank Zampiello had Frank's of Beats much later on. Um, Peter Bellucci, these are the brothers. They weren't a couple, but nothing, nothing says that. Um, so these brothers, Peter, um, had a bakery starting in 24 um, at this site. So that's, that is uh, sort of when we understand this gentleman was baking pizza and bread at the same time on this site. So at least we have some knowledge of that. Um, so you're saying that... The earliest that we know there was pizza in 14 Donnelly Place was 1924? The earliest that we can, yeah, the earliest we can basically from, prove. Yeah. I think one of the, the useful points of this type of list is it helps to create like a, a, a static. So it can always be improved. It can always be changed if more information comes in. But it's, it's giving ideas of, of, you know, the connection between a baker, which is generally how New Haven Pizza started. It was through the bakeries. Um, and how they became pizzerias, you know, yeah, what we so might consider are, a restaurant. Were, were the people on the on the left, these bakers, were they the owners of the bakery at 14 Donnelly Place, or they were? Yes. Yeah. Each one of these were, were were listed as the owner, 
in all types of records. So they would have been, they would have owned the business, maybe not the building. Um, and we're not including like employees, for example. Yeah, but, but these are the proprietors listed. These in are, the yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Frank Rocco, um, he, he had a place, he actually bought out a, a guy named Ro Rocco Razatani and he, he ran that place for many years. Um, and this name is familiar for many Zupardi. Um, Domenico Zupardi started here in 1932. Um, and we know that he moved to uh, West Haven, which is the next town over and started his own uh, pizzeria there and bakery. And, you know, you've got others. So there was, an, there was another um, pizzeria out on the site starting in 1937 called Superior. So this is just an, a nice little list to show that, you know, some of the importance of that kind of site. These, there were a number of these old bake ovens all around town. I mean, there were dozens of them. Every, every old baker would have to have a huge oven like that in order to produce bread. Um, they would heat what was known as coke, which was a, a byproduct of coal, and it was made in New Haven. Um, so those kind of big ovens, are, or we, we now see it in many of the historic pizzerias, and um, there's a good reason for it. Um, Colin, was, yeah. Uh, of those pizzerias you just listed, are any of them still around today? Yeah. Um, zoo parties? Zoo parties. That's it. Okay. Yep. And Domenico Zoo Party started, or maybe not started, but at one point owned for the business at 14 Donnelly Place. Correct. It cool. was known as Salerno's Bakery. Um, and he, his partner was a cousin named Andrew Esposito, in Italian say Esposito, but it's Esposito, of course, in America. The, the pronunciation is fun. You stick with whatever makes you feel good. I like Everything. Esposito. I, I feel like it's, it makes it feel yeah. more accurate. Yeah. Um, this is a New Haven bread company. These are all these guys were different Italian bakers. Um, this is Antonio Iacarino, who we saw earlier on the uh, carriage, on the, on the wagon. Um, and these, all these guys were different bread bakers doing different things. And I, my understanding is, I believe this gentleman here opened up a pizzeria in the 20s. His name was uh, Pietro Vici or Vecchi. Um, so we've got some really great archive images and things. We just, it's, you know, you're looking at New Haven Bread Company. They didn't make pizza. So I just think it's nice to see the, the strength of the Italian bakers. Um, one thing to note is there's, there are actually records of the American bakers. Um, they don't indicate whether it's pizza bakers, pie bakers, or bread bakers, but there's records of American bakers uh, in the 20s, and they talk about each city and each ethnicity and, and working hours and how much they made. And interestingly, found, I did, I did a, some simple math, and I found out that the New Haven Italian bakers worked longer hours and made less money than every single other ethnicity and city in the entire country for the three years that I found the record. So these guys, there was a lot of baking going on, no doubt, and they had to produce a lot and not a lot of money. And hmm. I, I just think that's very interesting. And it explains a lot about why there were so many Italian bakers and hence perhaps why there became so many pizzerias. And Colin, what was the source for that information? You said you, you found... Uh... Um, these, were, these were books that came out in sequence um, in the early 20s. They were uh, records of bakeries. Uh, it's actually, I've got a bibliography in my book and I can get that for you. I got um, it. Yeah, it's in there. It's in there. You. Cool, that's um, bad. Dude, I'm, I'm so excited to hear about this photo because I'm already looking at that bag of flour. <laughs> So you are looking at a bread bakery. I'm sorry, it's just bread. But no, it, okay. we're, it. we're getting closer. This is the, um, what was known as the, the Lenya Bakery. Um, and this bakery was run by this gentleman right here. He, um, as you can see, there's the bench, as we know it in the pizza world. These guys are rolling out dough with heavy flour. They are grabbing this dough from the wooden proofing boxes, very, and this is a 1933 photo, as far as we can tell. It's from a 1933 book about Italians in Connecticut. Um, and then you can see this massive oven, similar to the kind that we were talking about at um, Donnelly Place. This is a Coke-fired oven. They, this would be a bread oven, a French bread oven. And this guy's got a, ma a really long peel, bread peel that he's pushing in. And, and if you took away these rolls right here, 
and maybe you didn't see these guys rolling, you could just say, hey, this was a, this is a pizzeria today in New Haven. Um, and this is a very, this is how pizzerias like Frank Pepe's and Sally's Abit's, they still operate and, and modern to some degree, they still operate with these kinds of conditions. You said that the name of this bakery was the Dalenya Bakery? Not Da, just Lenya. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was just known as the Lenya Bakery. It was uh, Italian, you know, Italian run. Um, and, you know, it had different bakers at different times. They were on, they were in the old neighborhood, but there was, again, another old Italian bakery. This is going back to um, sort of the, the Grand Avenue district. Um, this is a street called Hamilton Street. And we're going to look at, you know, here, this was actually an Italian tenement house on the left with an Italian bar. And it was these situations where you can't see it in the photo, but there was a bakery in the back, in the backyard, and they would have baked bread. This was An Angelo Gentile's bakery. So we learned that he baked down the street. Now he baked here in about 1915. And this would have been a situation where pizza could have been offered to people on the street. So we don't know, but it gives you an idea of what New Haven looked like around 1915 when we do know pizza got its start. So I'm gonna take you through a few of the early pizzioli in New Haven, pizza makers. Um, the earliest record of a pizzioli, pizzioli in New Haven we have is Domenico Cacciopoli. Um, he, as far as we know in the records, he was listed, and this is a 1911 record, as a confectionery. And his confectionery was right here where I'm circling with my cursor in the middle of, of this on Collis Street. And this is a really cool map, Scott. This map was made of all New Haven. In 1923, they used blueprint map um, of what was existing around that time. And then they walked the city and they took notes <laughs> and they noted everything that was, everyone who was living in the buildings. And every time they found Italians living in a building, they were Italians or Ital. And they, went, they did the same thing for African-Americans, Jewish Americans, Polish Americans. Um, and that's, those are the, and, and Italians. And those are the four groups that they decided to, what we would later call red line um, on these types of maps to understand, you know, who was living in places and how to evaluate those places. And that's, it is a lot of injustice in that um, because it, you know, it unfairly, put these neighborhoods in a certain way, like the highway. <laughs> they started building highways where a lot of Italians and um, African-Americans lived and Jewish communities lived. So this does have a huge impact on um, why pizzerias moved to the suburbs later on. A lot of subjects here, man. So, um, so Domenico Cacciopoli, his family um, is, the, is our only source um, that he truly was the first pizza maker, one of the first pizza makers in New Haven. Um, we, my only indication of him was that he was a confectioner and he moved around a couple of times. He ended up working for Sargent, uh, the hardware company as a silver plater. And that's the last we know of it. So, so yeah. When does the family say that he was making pizza? They actually don't know. So they're, a lot of the premise of many, many families in New Haven, and this is kind of interesting because we see this in so many places, but the premise of a lot of families that started a pizza business at some point all claim that Frank Pepe worked for their grandfather. That's like, that's like the, the claim. And yeah. they all say it and they don't want to hear anything else. So I've talked with a lot of these family members and I, I want to hear what they say. And then I want to try to find anything I can proving or disproving these, these claims, you know, and most of them, most of them have nothing to do with Frank Pepe. Um, but, but most of them do have uh, some history making pizza. So it's, it's just about digging and digging and doing our best to, to either prove or disprove something. And um, in, some, in my case, I couldn't directly prove through any kind of, you know, documentation yet, but I, I was able to put some of this stuff together to try to explain he had a, this is a grocery store. He had a confectionery in an Italian neighborhood. I mean, none of this is surprising that it could be a pizza, pizzeria. Well, this is something that you and I talked about the other day. And I know I've talked about this with Peter and you know, with other people who do this kind of research, which is that every little piece of evidence that nudges you closer to a conclusion is helpful, but that the you're only getting closer to the conclusion. 
it's hard to really get a lock on that conclusion. So starting with a family story is helpful, but it will never, it's never the end proof. It's always, well, the family story says this, and can I find other evidence that proves any piece of that puzzle? So at least we know Domenico Cacciapoli was a baker, a confectioner, and the family says made pizza, but did he, or do we have evidence of him at any point running a pizzeria? That seems like maybe unconfirmed. It's unconfirmed. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think the oral history is such a valuable part of this, you know, storytelling because, you know, between you, myself and Peter and a few other people, we are some of the only people trying to tell the story of the history of pizza in America. And I think that's, it is a really, it's a subject that's never really been vetted properly. So I think we're just now appreciating and val evaluating it. So it's very interesting, you know, and we, we're going to find out more. I'm sure of it. Um, so a, a secondary family story um, that I decided to illustrate, therefore it made it real. <laughs> I drew that. It was fun. Um, but uh, Francesco Scelso um, was um, his family, again, they, they claim Pepe worked for them, that they sold him the oven and somehow moved it, um, a massive 14 foot oven. I'm not sure if that's even possible. And the records would indicate that it's not. But what we do understand, and the records show that it's starting in 1916, he was listed as a baker owning uh, a bakery down this alley. And in the back of this alley was in fact a large bake oven um, as maps indicate. And on the front, the story the family had was that a, uh, a they hired a Polish sign maker who misspelled pizzeria and he wrote pizzeria. So that's just my little comic way of, of saying it. And I feel like that story was such a great, it had comedy, it had anger in it. Um, and it showed this kind of like funny thing that you can't, you don't really just make that up. It's sort of like a, it's so strange. Um, but it's a nice little detail um, explaining that there was more than likely a pizzeria located on this site uh, in starting in 1916. So um, another kind of interesting but like hazy story that we start with. Can you see that sign if you sharpen up the picture or are you You're, imagining the sign? No, this article was from 1929 and the pizzeria he died in 1925 mm. so there is there would be i mean theoretically that pizzeria was done and this became a vacant store um i do know that by that by this time so that's why the drawing happened <laughs> yep but still we um, see plenty of bakeries happening in the 1910s 19 teens absolutely commercialization was happening all over cities you know um increased population so Ignazio Camposano is, is easily the first recorded um, pizza maker uh, in New Haven. So that was something where, again, another family came to me and kept telling me ever well before I wanted to ever write a book um, about pizza. He said, I, his grandson said, Pepe worked for my grandfather. <laughs> and, and I had to just, I had to just listen at one, at some point and say, okay, let's look at this guy. And um, here he is. So Ignazio Camposano, um, show, is showing up for the first time as a baker in 1917 at 14 Donnelly Place, um, the bake house we first saw. And in all these city directories where we're finding this information, they'll never, they don't list pizzeria. That word doesn't show up until a bit later. And it's different in different cities. Uh, it's different when you get to the telephone directory versus a city directory. Even the word pizza itself and pizzeria wasn't necessarily a word that was used or traded um and a lot of it could be a language barrier there could be like the simple question is are you a restaurant are you a grocery store are you a confectioner or are you a baker there would be no category for pizzeria so we do know that he again he had a bakery in as early as 1917 we don't know the family says they he was making pizza in fact his ellis island uh immigration record indicates he was a baker coming in from italy and he was from Ashera, Italy. Um, Domenico, by the way, um, the last gentleman that we, excuse me, Francesco, the last gentleman we saw uh, was, was from outside of Naples. So all, a lot of these guys are from regions that, that make pizza, that traditionally make pizza. And 
Ignazio uh, eventually opened up a pizzeria on Hill Street. Um, if you look on the right of this 1940 photograph, you can see a sign that says uh, Pizzeria Napolitana. Um, and just before that sign, there was a storefront. This is where he opened up in 1924. We don't have an image of his sign from that time. However, this 1940 image shows his, he moved across the street. And if you look closely at this, it says Campasano's, and that's not pronounced a pizza. It's a beats, another New Haven colloquial word. We'll explain later. And so this was actually Campasano's fourth home, bakery home. Um, so if you would look in the city directories at this, it was listed either as a bakery or a restaurant. And especially after 1934, when um, alcohol would have been allowed, um, he was listed as a restaurant, while as before that time, he was listed as a baker. However, this indicates that starting in 1935, he was located on this site. So it just shows that signage and photographs is a huge part of our investigation um, in New Haven to find out whether a place was a bakery or also a pizzeria. Um, and this is this was vindication. Um, this other pizzeria here was actually called Kiki's, and it was a, a guy named uh, Gaetano Pasqua um, who had run a club here. That's all we knew. It was a club, but it turns out it was also a pizzeria, and um, some other, you know, some different bakers were working there, and a gentleman who grew up on the street remembered the club, so we have lots of different information coming in to help tell the story. Here it is close up, 1935, the football team, Campasano's Pizzeria Napolitana. Um, and there's, this is Anthony Campasano, that's um, Ignazio's son. And we're about to see a close up of him making pizza. And I know you love this photo, Scott, because it is one of the earlier photos we have of anyone making pizza. Um, it's, this is from about 1935. This is about the time that we saw that last image. Um, you can see he's at a bench, you can see the, the wooden peel, you can see a kind of a backsplash of a wooden bench. Um, there's a menu on the wall. We can just make out some of the ingredients and pricing. And then when we look at this pizza, which is very flat, we would call that New Haven style even before it's cooked. Um, it clearly has tomato, crushed tomato on it. And it clearly is getting lined with anchovies. And anchovies is one of the early toppings in New Haven. Um, and when we think of the toppings in New Haven, we're generally talking about toppings that you didn't have to refrigerate. So anchovies would be one of those. Um, so would onions, so would garlic, so would you know cured meats and um, Pecorino Romano cheese. So these are all things that bakers could make without necessarily having a refrigerator. Very kind of a very important part of the evolution of bakeries into pizzerias. Here is uh, Anthony um, putting a pizza in his, I believe it's a universal uh, oven. This is a, what was known as a portable coal, coal or coke fired oven. And I believe that this oven might've been brought from one bakery to the next for Mr. Campasano, so that they would pull it out of the wall and send it to the next spot. And they kept moving every 10 years, he'd move to a different spot and bring, and I believe bring this particular oven with him. So, this is a smaller, maybe eight by eight um, oven. It you didn't need a long peel to put the pizza in. Um, you can see that this peel is missing its rod, which would usually be right here. Um, but here's the pizza. It's a half anchovy and half sauce. Sure looks like that. So I'm not sure who likes anchovies. I kind of like it. I don't know if I'd want that many on my pizza, but there's a 1935 pizza for you. And they're quite large, like it's large chunks. They do look large, like they're fil big fillets. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or could it be sardine? Well, if we look back at this image and you look at the shape of some of these, they look they look more like anchovies. Now, I'm I'm also judging that these photos were taken in sequence, based on everything I can see, um, especially you know the outfit, the hair, the, you know, the pie itself, the fact that he had a camera show up at the pizzeria to take these two photos. So I'm thinking that what we're seeing might just be optically make, making the fish look larger, but. Do you, this is a weird, weird question. Do you know if he was left-handed or right-handed? It's a good question. 
I'm just wondering because if he was right-handed, then right now he's just posing for a picture. You know, <laughs> uh, um, like if I was a photographer, I'd say, "Oh no, no, put your right hand on that, on the lever." Well, here's so that's a good point. Um, there is all sorts of possibilities. If we look at this photo, his right hand is placing the actual uh, topping. Well, his left hand is unless, and the photo is flat because we know this is the right orientation because the the menu looks, yeah, look backwards. Correct. Yep. Um, and then this one, we know it's the right orientation because there's letters here. Yeah, universal. So, so one of the things is that um, there's many reasons why he might be using his left hand. Um, for one thing, um, he might have been taught to do it this way, um, you know, by a left-hander. But left-handers were not common in the old days. I think everyone who was left-handed was forced to be a right-hander. Yeah, Colin, I, I think it's if, – if he's right-handed, he's currently posing for a picture. Makes you sense. I, I, the lighting I, was better. Yeah, I, I just feel like – well, were these – these were for a publication or were these just family photos? So the family shared these with me. Um, I don't know their use. So we don't know why they took them. Um, they could just be a record of, of having, you know, some showing what they did, but sure. we don't, I don't have an, any indication that these were going to be used in a newspaper or for any other purpose. Maybe they were, and we have yet to find it, but for cool. now, no. And, and Colin, did you say that, what was the year that it's confirmed that the Camposanos were making pizza? So 1924 is when it's lit, his bakery business is listed as a restaurant. Okay. So and and that, was, that was on Hill. Bakery to restaurant. It goes like, from bakery to restaurant and he moved location. So he went from a, a backyard bakery in 1923 and listed in 1924 as a, a front yard bakery. Cool. Yeah. There's some crayon on our, um, <laughs> do you see that crayon? Yeah, somebody's somebody might be scribbling. It'll go okay. away. Okay, I don't want to get Zoom uh, bombed. I think we're okay. Okay, um, interesting. So, uh, Camposanos Abits. Um, this is an ad from 1944, and um, it's kind of fun because it shows how in New Haven we'd call it Italian tomato pie or Neapolitan tomato pie. Um, that was the translation of Abits, and then. It's saying that he was saying that he's the oldest uh, beats maker in New Haven. A few years before that, he said one of the oldest. <laughs> so it's kind of fun to see that there's competition already in 1944 for, for who's older. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a sign of pride. It's a sign of, hey, why is this other person saying they're, they've been around for this many years? I, we are the oldest. So there's a, I'm not going to say this is a definitive proof that he is the longest running or the oldest, but he was saying he was, which is also kind of interesting. And this was found in a uh, city directory. Okay, next up, Giuseppe Sarno. Um, here we've got an image of him at his old bakery, um, literally in the parking lot of Pepe's um, today. Um, he was snuck between the two different Pepe sites and he came from the same town as, as Pepe. Would you mean and, uh, Pepe's and the spot? So the spot would be on the left and Pepe's would be on the right today. And there was an, a separate lot, huh. and I'll show you it in the next slide, that literally was um, another bakery and it was, it was Giuseppe's. And so as we can see in this uh, particular 1923 telephone directory, you can see Giuseppe Sarno's first listed at 159 Worcester. Um, that's a great photo of his horse because he was doing deliveries and that's his you know he was bringing the horse and wagon into this site and the, if we look at the next image oh here is his oven hmm. this was actually a sicilian baker that showed up after um mr sarno this was um uh carmine oh my gosh i have Midol midolo and he made these wonderful sicilian breads here um, like wreaths, I love them. Yeah, I don't have the name for these breads. Maybe someone knows and could could list it. But you can see again a very large, um, possibly Middleby oven. Maybe not. It could be a Dutchess County uh, tool. Um, but it's a very large coal coke fired oven with long peels. This was very common. Um, you can see a lot of different things happening here. But this is the oven that Giuseppe Sarno first used in 1923. 
he was a bread and pizza maker. The family established that as their start date. Um, but in all records, they indicate that he was a baker. And now we can see an, a front view of how to get to his bakery. Um, Frank Pepe's is on the right. The spot is down an alley on the left. This is from 1961, by the way. And this alley would take you at this point to Brazil's bakery down that alley. But that was actually Sarno's bakery originally. So now we're just kind of getting some bearings, but there's a lot of bakeries on the street. Yeah, and, and I think another, there's another pizzeria over to the left. I never know. That. Yeah. Oh, that's, is that the spot? That's the spot, yeah. Okay. But at this time, when this photo was taken, there were seven or eight bakeries on the street, including about five pizzerias. So it was a very, Wor Worcester Street in the Worcester Square area was a center of the Italian community. Um, it had a lot of these businesses on it. And now we're looking at this um, engineering map again. And um, <laughs> so glad that these marks are here. But um, what we're looking at is Worcester Street, and the present location of Pe Frank Pepe's, I am circling it. This is 1923, so this is two years before Frank Pepe actually opened. And what we can see is that there's a wholesale grocery, there's a fish dealer here <laughs> in the back. Um, next door, where Giuseppe Sarno moved, there's a fruit store in the front. And here in the back is where Giuseppe Sarno's bakery was. And you can see this writing, it says, All Bakery, Bakery. Wow. And this was all Giuseppe's bakery and pizzeria. He would take it out on, on his wagon and, and deliver bread and deliver pizza around the town, mostly to factories. That's what, we, that's what this, the family has contributed, and we can see some evidence through some of these old photos. Um, this alley here is where, how you'd get to the spot. And as you can see in 1923, what is now the spot was both live poultry market and it was a bakery. We don't know who was baking there. Um, that's one of the fun mysteries is that there's a lot of stories by the family that lived in this property and ran the poultry market. They were the, the Bacchamaiellos um, that ben, Vincenzo and his family, they ran the, the poultry market, but that they were supposed to marry, uh, someone was gonna marry a baker and never did. And that bakery sat vacant until 1925, at which point um, our, another character that we'll meet named Francesco Pepe, um, he would show up and, and use it. But it's showing you on this street, you've got a lot of different activities happening. Here's a macaroni factory. Um, in 1923, uh, Pepe worked here. We, we have evidence that Pepe worked in this bakery and macaroni factory. Um, you've got confections across the street. That's Libby's, for those who know the name Libby's, which has now moved here. So there's just so much going on here. And we could spend three hours on this, but I want to move. <laughs> I just can't. So here's the same view, 1941, parade down the street. Pepe's is where my cursor is. Here's, again, Madolo's is next. The spot is after that. Canastri's pastry shop is here. And right here, you can see Joseph Sarno, Italian bakery. Uh, I believe it says something about bread. Um, and then it says Abitz with an arrow. So the deal with that is they had a restaurant in the front and they had a, a, a bakery in the backyard. <laughs> So you could actually, they would serve, they'd have to serve the pizza through the rain in, if it was raining in order to get it to the restaurant. It was a really funny thing, but they were saying, hey, get your pizza down this alley. And all these alleys were basically pizzerias. Giuseppe Sarno used to be here, but that was a pizzeria. That's a bakery. That's Pepe's. There's another bakery. That's a pastry shop. There's another. So there's seven bakeries on a block right here. It's pretty, it's, it's very intense. Is there any indication of where the where breads would be delivered? Would it be just in the Italian neighborhood, or are they going beyond? I don't. I don't have those records. I always make assumptions that Italians were eating Italian bread, and it would go to their delis, it would go to the grocery stores, and to large homes or tenements, and and to the factories. But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna claim that because the truth is the only businesses that we see that bread businesses that survived in New Haven are two of the major three of the major um, bread bakeries, mm. you know, and they were Italians. So it, it says something that more than just Italians were buying bread. Um, but today's world, we have Apicella's Bakery and we have Lupi Lenya Marchigiano Bakery and another one called Venice. And those ones go way back. Um, so it's very possible that other people were eating Italian bread at restaurants all over New Haven. I, I would bet that if we could find records. 
Yeah, I mean, it certainly it wouldn't make much sense that it's just staying within the neighborhood. I'm just thinking so yeah. many breads, uh, yeah. so many bakeries, rather. And yeah. you know, fortunately, you have maps and you have records of uh, of where the where the ovens were located, and that those ovens didn't go away. Multiple bakers would take them over. Yeah, absolutely. Until you know the the day of reckoning when coal and coke was you know becoming diminished, and those sure. and that archaic ovens were just not appreciated. Um, I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit, but um. Sorno's Pizza, you know, you can see a pizzeria that's a 1939 ad. Um, that's an, uh, apparently an original uh, Giuseppe Sarno um, apron that the uh, his grandson, you know, showed me and allowed me to take a photo of. So it's kind of a cool artifact that I like to show off. Just, you know, little things that make you realize that these guys were very proud of making pizza. I mean, these were these were bakers, but they were really, pizza was such a, was really like a competitive thing. It was a, it was something that they all could put their mark on. So each one of these bakers really focused a lot on what we what we call abits. Um, you can see this guy also made a bunch of other dishes. Um, yeah, but this is interesting because it's calling itself a pizzeria and it's listing the food as tomato pies, but that word abits is nowhere to be seen. Well, it's not. A, it's a translation. So tomato pies is synonymous with abits. Right, but, but what I'm saying is today yeah. the word abits is used. At, at this point, 1939, I think is what you said? Well, so thirty. So it, it this ad just happens to not have it, but there I do have another ad from the same year from the newspaper. This is from a uh, telephone directory, and I have a nineteen thirty nine ad that says Sarno's Abits. They actually changed the name and they just called it Abits. But that's it's neither one nor the other. I think they'd call it whatever they want to. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like yeah. one day it's Abits, and the next day it's Pizzeria. <laughs> I just want, I wonder if it's because of the audience. Like, is the audience in this phone book a general audience? Yeah, I would not know that word abits and is putting the phrase tomato pies an easier phrase for a non-Italian speaker to understand. I wonder. If, I think that's a great question. I mean, I'm, we're, we're going to get to that when you talk about abits and the origin of that word. Absolutely. On December 8th. No, I'm showing you whatever you <laughs> um, So th this guy's laughing with you, Scott. This is Fran Francesco Pepe. Um, he is, at this point, one of the most prominent names in American pizza. Um, it's hard to talk about American pizza without saying something about Frank Pepe and his contribution. Number one in the country keeps happening. New Haveners love, I guess I said it, New Haveners love that he existed and his family did what they did. And, and he was an, a very, very special person. Um, clearly, this was a, a character. Um, he had a lot of photography. The family has so many archives of, of of their of his existence so we have a lot on him and it's very fortunate because he's still around there's you know 11 or 12 and counting um peppies these days but he started off small um he was uh worked in a factory he came back to new haven in 1920 and was a baker working giuseppe sarno this is the one thing i could prove giuseppe sarno likely a friend lived in the same building from the same town, encouraged Pepe to open up in 1925. I think there was a, a Pepe and Sarno connection and they literally opened up next to each other and the families have nothing against each other. So they were in no competition when they had pizzerias next to each other. That's a, a cool thing. Um, but we can see in the uh, directory for 1926, the phone directory that um, he was located at the spot now. He was noted, noted as a baker. And look at that, his number starts with Pioneer, which I think is actually kind of cool that that's like your, you know, that's like the kind of I have foretelling phone number that he might have in the future. This is the spot from 1961. Um, this was actually when it be, was a different family, the Bacimaiello ran it, but this is how it would have looked back in the day. Um, this was actually a chicken coop. <laughs> and today they're all one building, but that's actually how you'd get back to Frank Pepe's Pizzeria, and this is inside about 1930, around the, you know the time that. Um, anyway, so what we're looking at is uh, Francesco and his wife. You've got a pizza here. Um, you can see the old bakery. This is a Dutchess County tool. Um, here's another photo from the same era, about 1930. We got Frank Pepe, his brother Peter, who was a baker going back to about 1908 in New Haven. Um, his nephew Tony Consiglio his cousin Gaetano and his other nephew Salvatore Consiglio otherwise known as Sally 
and look who's who look who has the pizza in front of them so here's the proofing boxes that we've seen um a lot of the same action that you would see at a bakery but they're making pizza and these 1930 photos both showing pizza um in, and Pepe's clearly proud he's cutting it with a knife to get lots of evidence of how pizza was processed and and that it was their principal business. I mean, and he was delivering, we know he had a wagon and a horse and he also had a, a push cart. So he was doing a lot of delivery, eventually opening their doors to people. And then this image, which was, was as everything we can tell, if you look at a 1930 image of Frank on the left, and then you look at Frank here, he's younger. And this is what I was telling Peter last week is that this is more than likely a 1925 business opening photo, show off what you can show off, put a sardine or an anchovy on it, whatever that fish is. And we're gonna do a close up here. Um, and you can see that this pizza, no one could have afforded this pizza in 1925. This is an anchovy, garlic, tomato pizza. It had a lot of stuff going on in this. And um, looking at this today, this is nothing, it almost seems a little bit like what we eat today, but not as a topping. We don't do toppings like this in New Haven. So what a, what a neat find. Um, clearly this is showing that you could do what you wanted with pizza with these minimal toppings, make it, make it art. Um, as far as I can tell, this is one of the oldest images of, of a pizza in, in our country um, that we have that's actually a photo. Um, I look forward to seeing others. And you know, it says a lot about the kind of pizza that was being made from an immigrant who learned from his family who were all immigrants coming over to this country so you know questions about whether this was how neapolitan pizza looked you know in maori was this an americanized version was you know was pizza look, did pizza look like this back in italy we, these are all the questions that we that i'd like to keep asking so interesting because that image yeah it's it 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 doesn't look anything like new haven pizza today even on the edge, you know, it's got this big fluffed up bit. It looks like bits where some tomato ran over the edge and maybe burned. And is it sitting on a piece of corrugated cardboard? Yeah, that was the corrugated cardboard is what they used to put pizza on. So if you were like going to take pizza to go, right. you put it on a piece of cardboard, wrap in that in baker's paper, yeah. tie it up before the box. Wild. Okay. Here's some um, close up. Yep. Yeah. Close-ups of the pizzas from the prior photos from 1930. So now, you know, you're again, you're seeing what what these are almost definitely what we call tomato pies, plain New Haven pizzas. Very simple um, tomato, pecorino cheese on top. That's it. And you are basically seeing, um, you know, this very simple ridge line that seems to pop up, but a very thin crust pizza, minimal cornicione, except for those kind of like angles. But I think this is a nice way of kind of comparing similar period pizzas. Um, they almost appear to be two different sizes too. This one appears to be small and this one appears to be medium, maybe, you know, 14 inch or something. Um, but there's more investigation to be done, um, you know, to kind of see, hey, what's going on with these pizzas? And is it, how much have they changed? How much are they similar? Um, here's Pepe in front of his new place in 1930. Uh, this is actually 45, but, he moved here in 1936, um, bought both buildings, opened up what was considered to be one of the largest pizzerias in the country at the time, 150 seats in two dining rooms. Um, it was a big deal. This was his massive oven, 14 by 14 foot, Middleby oven built in Boston. He had a bar, um, the sign reads clams on the half shell. And that is a very special sign because we know now that Pepe was one of the first people to put clams on pizza. Um, now there is a signboard up here. It's very hard to read that. Someday we'll get to that. Um, and then there's this Pepe's pizza box. This was the oldest record of a pizza box we've ever seen. I don't know if there's another older record, but in the, on this pizza box, there's a lot of really neat information. Booths for ladies. Uh, Connecticut didn't allow uh, women into bars. And as you can see from the last image, it was kind of a bar besides a restaurant, um, but they wanted to make sure that women could be invited and they would advertise that. Um, beer, soda, and clams. That soda would be Fox and Park soda. The clams would be the Little Neck clams. Uh, the beer was 
could was changing actually every year they'd have a different beer it seemed like um old reliable became his code name he was just known as old reliable starting in the 1930s that was kind of his catch name um <laughs> and you can see established in 1925 so they're they're keeping a record for us this is a, a circa 1936 pizza box that we're looking at he had just moved to the new location at 157 Worcester Street. In the photo taken by Emilio de Casati in his studio, that's a scene of a Amalfi in the background, there's a pizza box. He's got a pizza on a box. And the reason why he even likely has a box is because he had to walk about or drive, whatever, about 10 blocks to get to this photo studio. So there's a record, <laughs> two records of a pizza box in one image. It's kind of fascinating. Uh, we're going to move on. Um, these three guys become very important. Um, you know, after we, you know, Pepe is a huge story, but Salvatore Consiglio was Pepe's nephew. And he, and he opened up his own pizzeria after training with his uncle, working at other places. He opened up in 1938 down the street at a former pizzeria. And you can see the ad here uh, from the 50s. Another historic pizzeria in New Haven is Antonio Tolli. Um, he learned to bake from his uncle, who was a pastry maker named Giuseppe Marzullo. And he opened up a number of pizzerias, probably about seven to eight total, um, including two that exist today. One is called Modern Abit's Place, and the other is called Tolli's, or Tolli's, named after him. Um, so modern in the iteration of pizzerias that he started, it was in 1934, and it was originally called Washington Pizzeria, um, then Tony's Abits, and then Modern. So you can see there's changes that happened in, even in naming these places. Um, on the right-hand side here is Domenico Zupardi. We've talked about him a little bit. He's also from Maori, same town as Frank Pepe, same town as Giuseppe Sarno. And he, um, this is him in front of his West Haven uh, bakery with his son, Anthony. Um, right before the war, actually, he went to camp. He didn't actually fight. He was uh, a cook. And Zupardi's a Beats, this ad is from 1945. And we realized that the, the name Zupardi's a Beats started in 1945. But prior to that, it was known as Salerno's Bakery. Um, and we have evidence that Salerno's did make pizza. So there's just so many innuendos when you're talking about date and name and when does it become a Beats or when does it become a pizzeria. I think those things are sometimes fluid. And I wanted to show some menus at the, we're nearly ended with our, with my presentation <laughs> part, just so you know. And uh, I wanted to show some menus. This is um, Pepe's menu from 1945. Okay, anchovies and tomatoes. Those aren't fresh tomatoes. Those are just tomato on your pizza, like crushed tomato. Um, bacon, cheese, and tomato. All right. That cheese is not mozzarella. That cheese is the Pecorino Romano with, with what we're going to call tomato sauce. Cream cheese would shock most people, but it's not really cream cheese. It's That's mozzarella. So we call, again, in New Haven, we say mutz or mutz. That cream cheese was a translation of the word mozzarella. And today, Sally's and Pepe's both write CC on their tickets when people order a mozzarella pie because it's cream cheese. Really? Dates, yes. Dates that. back to that translation. Chicken, cheese, and tomato. There's something that needs a refrigerator. Salami, cheese, and tomato. Um, cheese and tomato, just your plain pie. Pie with onions. Why not list it separately? A mushroom pie. Who knew? Um, and then clams on the half shell, but not an indication that clams is on the menu by 1945. This is about when clams started. Now, in 1955, this ad, which is fun. Wait, 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 Colin, hold on. Yeah, okay. An indication of when clams started, what do you mean? For when they okay, started so, clams? Sorry, yeah. So Frank Pepe was one of the first um, pizzioli to put clams on the menu on a pizza. He, as we understand it, invented a pizza called the white clam pie. Um, it's a white pies are without sauce. So it's just clams and garlic and no one seemed to have experimented with that until Pepe did, um, according to the records. What, so, when, when did they start adding clams to the pizza? So Pepe's family 
um, indicates that they started doing it shortly after World War II, so starting around 1945. But they do, it doesn't show up on the menu until after Pepe's death. So I think there's some interest. I think there's a very interesting story about how it became. It may have been the biggest secret is that you could order a Pepe special. And it Did I ever show you the menu France. from Mario's Restaurant on Arthur Avenue in the Bronx? There's a menu from 1940 that's got a pizza with clams on it. Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah, I don't know if it had tomato on it. I don't know if it was a white pie, but a pizza that had clams on it. I would um, love to see that. And I'm flipping through your book right now because I remember finding uh, a menu for Sally's that also had chicken on a pizza. And it's, it's mind boggling because you would think today, any, like any, any purist would say, oh, I'd never have chicken on my pizza. Meanwhile, Peppy <laughs> and Sally's had it. Get your protein, man. Um, well, funny thing is, I feel like, I feel like you worked on this, this with me because the next slide <laughs> Sally's menus. Oh, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I love it. I, I swear you, you were secretly like investigating this, uh, this talk or you knew it, um, which is, you know, it's smart. But um, anyway, so we'll, we'll skip right to Sally's. Um, oh, so yeah, we got to show this. This is so cool. Yeah, three separate menus, very similar menus. Uh, the changes happened, of course. So we've got an original menu from 1938 when Sally's opened, um, a World War II menu, 1945, and a 1955 um, menu, and, and you can see the price differences. Uh, cheese and tomato is, again, it's just a to crushed tomato with Pecorino Romano. It's not mozzarella. They didn't, they, you can see cream cheese is offered. That's mozzarella. Um, so cheese and tomato is 25 cents for a small pizza, probably 12 inches. Um, they had four sizes. Crazy. That was that for four sizes though. So in 1945, that price goes up to 40 cents for the same pizza. And in 1955, that price goes up to 50 cents. Now, so you can, wait, yeah. when they drop down to three sizes, did, did they lose the smallest or did they lose the largest or did, did they lose one of the in-between sizes, do you think? I'm going to guess they lost this in-between here. The second price tier doesn't match. So right, if you were to raise, in price. yeah, if you're going to raise prices over seven years, 25 cents would go to 40, not 50 to 40. 75 would go to 80 and a dollar would go to a dollar 25. So I think they lost that middle. I'm guessing they, they did like a, you know, like a yeah, 13 well, I, inch pie. I don't know. <laughs> it's crazy to even have that. Wait, and, and now their clams are certified. Um, yes. Yeah, so certified. So, you know, clams could be dangerous um, if you're eating a raw clam. And clams were offered at every <laughs> pizzeria in New Haven and nearly every restaurant. Um, they were served on a half shell and they'd be even guys on the street would sell them just like in Italian neighborhoods yeah. in New York city and others. And so there was an appetizer. Um, but what we can see from a 1955 menu here is that this is one of the early evidences in New Haven of a clam pizza. Um, and it predates Pepe's. So we know that other people were putting clams on pizza. This was a tomato pie. Um, and it's, it's just interesting to see these, you know, this change happen and um, even Sally's when they got cursive, they got kind of, you know, cute. Fancy. Uh, dude, yeah. I'm also loving that they're using the word mozzarella in 1945. Y yes. So they're spelling it fine. They're spelling it different. If you look back here, um, follow my cursor down here below on the right hand side, Mo it's spelled here mozzarella, totally yeah, yeah, different yeah. than you would see it. So there's a lot of, Figuring it out, I think that happened. I'm almost nervous to say because I'm I'm thinking it might be your next slide, but I know at Modern they've got some of those old receipts on the wall, and there's one that says mozzarella m u z z, and then there's a separate line for the word cheese. So again, yeah. coming at the difference between a hard cheese and mozzarella, yeah. which is Exa not exactly true. Scott, and this is it. So this this is cheese and tomato kind of washed out here. That's your Pecorino Romano. Oh, there it is. You've got mozzarella, which I don't know if that's the right way to, to put it in there, but they've got, you know, that cheese. And then you've got even American cheese, which is still offered um, at Modern. And we've estimated, I've estimated that this is a, a circa 1960 um, menu based on the price because mm -hmm. you've got 90 cents now. So if you remember Sally's in 1955 was a small was uh Let's check. It was 50 cents. This is also so frustrating because 
I, and I run into this all the time where, or like ordering pizza, small, medium, and large are not defined with numbers. So if one person's small is 12 inches, maybe another person's medium is 12 inches. It's hard to really figure it out. It's funny. Yeah. Photographic evidence might be the only way, but I think people expected this. They wouldn't have expected a size. Maybe they didn't even know what 12 inches was like. You know, well, but yeah. I, you know what? Subu's bringing up a good question in the chat. Is, is the term American cheese at this point, is that, do we know that that's the same cheese we call American cheese today? Yeah. yeah. Everything points to yes. Um, okay. American cheese was considered like a, the, the poor man's cheese at the time. Um, yeah. and it's, I mean, now it's, it's a cheese product. It's oil-based. It's not yeah. even really Great. Right. And, you know, I think they had a different effect on the pizza. It does taste. I've tried it. I, it tastes different. It has. I, different I love the pizza with American cheese on it at Modern. I love cool. it. Cool. Cool. I'll meet you there. Dude, um, I love modern. You know I love modern. Yeah, yeah. I know that. Um, okay, cool. So um, finally, um, this is, I think, my last slide. So finally, I wanted to just broach the subject of Abit's. And I've got a couple of, a few things to show. Um, the ad on the left is from 1937. Excuse me. Yeah, 1937. And what you're seeing here is sort of a, this is like a, a process of how that word, I, we understand the word came to be. Florentian Italian uses a preposition, it's la, and the word is pizza. But Nabilidan, which is otherwise known as Neapolitan, they say a ah, instead of la, or na instead of una, and you come up with the rest of the way that Neapolitan is, is spoken, and it's, it's, a, it's a beat. So you take off the last vowel, the P turns to a B, and there's many, many words like that. So it doesn't, it shouldn't be surprising that there would be an apostrophe between a preposition and the noun squeezed together as one word, especially in, in Neapolitan Italian or Neapolitan itself. Um, and this is, this in pro ghetto is an Italian, a uh, Florentian Italian little article from a 1908 Connecticut newspaper. And here they are having a really nice time telling about a, um, a bakery in a different part of Connecticut that's making focaccia, but even better, Nabit's Capumarola. Uh -huh. And that saying, Capumarola is sauce, is, is tomato sauce. Mm -hmm. It's a Neapolitan word for tomato sauce. And this is a saying that you see again in different way, places. That This is 1908, mind you. So they're saying una pizza but in, in they're quoting it because it's Nabili Don. And the Florentian, they didn't know how to say it, so they would have just said it huh. in the Nabili Don that everyone else would understand. Um, and that is, I thought was a very interesting way of explaining how this word has, has sort of progressed into our everyday in Connecticut and in, especially in New Haven. Um, above here is 1933. This is uh, um This is a, a pizzeria restaurant called Nick's. They clearly had the apostrophe here and they're saying one one pizza to every customer. They were making pizza in a in an oven. They were doing it on a tray. You know, this is like grandma style. But they still use the word abits. They're it's it's showing how this came into effect, how the family decided to write it. And then finally on the bottom right is an article from 1943 from a, a Washington DC newspaper. And they're explaining pizza in Coney Island. And they like the pizzas or Italian tomato pies seem to be a local product of Brooklyn, New York, where, and this is just somebody visiting Coney Island, where the Coney Island, uh, where on Coney Island, they go by the name of Abits. And you can see it in quotes. Finally, we get to see exactly that the way that we pronounce Abits is the way that they heard it in New York City. So it goes without saying that this word was once used by most anybody who was probably making pizza from the earliest days in America because they were using Nabili Dan, the old language, the original language that was used in Naples and all around Campania. Even in even that word would have been probably shown up in, in Sicily and Calabria and Abruz. So I think that this is the a great sort of beginning to another conversation about, you know, the use of, of the word abits and, and colloquialisms and um, it's a lot of fun. So I end um, with just the cover of my book. It's, uh, it's a sales pitch. Uh, 
you know, I got, we got to do something over here. Right. Yeah, so, no, um, people have been asking, you know, the book, the best place to get the book is at pizza in new And I know because I'm trying to order copies of the book and <laughs> the only copies in America right now are at pizza in new Yep. I've got, I've got some copies. We, we also, Scott and I have been scouting uh, like crazy. We've got, um, we learned that there's, they're floating on the ocean in a boat, some of them, and, uh, and the rest of them are getting sent by air to me. So I've got more coming, but I've got a bunch and um, would love to, you know, get, sign a copy for anyone. And, and obviously like, don't forget about Scott's book. This <laughs> is a very special book, The Art of the Pizza Box, Viva La Pizza. Um, it, it's, a, it's a masterpiece. And Scott but it's incomplete saying, because it leaves out the Frank Peppy pizza box. But that's okay. That's I didn't know about that till after. But no, um, we're always learning. So I know. Uh, first of all, thanks to everybody for hanging out. For uh, I, you really hung in there for a while. Thank I do you. have a few questions I want to bring up, just because of there's so much that we just went through. I mean, uh, first of all, for clarification, we have a 1908 article that mentions pizza in Connecticut. Um, that's explaining it as a focaccia. We've got the word abits. We've got explanation of the pronunciation. It makes me, and it hasn't come up for me yet, but it makes me really want to dig around for pizzerias in other cities. Like, do you have any, any thoughts on why, why wouldn't any pizzerias in Brooklyn have had used signage that used that spelling, A-P-I-Z-Z-A? Yeah, I, I thought maybe, about this a lot. Yeah. You know, I was realizing that one of the things about Connecticut's Italian community, and especially New Haven's, and I'm going to focus more on New Haven, but that we, since most of the people were from one region, they spoke, they mostly spoke Nablidan. So the people who didn't speak it, like the, the Marquesans, they spoke more of a Florentine Italian with a slight, they had their own dialect, but they wouldn't, they didn't understand each other. Mm. So they weren't necessarily able to kind of communicate and connect. And pizza was not a Marquesan food. So people from Marquesan had their own foods and their own interests and their own community. They didn't connect. And then whereas in New York City and other cities, I think what I'm seeing is that you have a much greater population of Italians from all different regions. And there's the only commonality that they have, it wouldn't be Napoli Don, it would have been, it would have been Italian. And since in Italian was the common language of say the unified Italy, it would have been more it proper to use proper Italian. So I think, again, like signage and language and trying to not be a, a peasant or act like trying to be a, what they would say is above a peasant and not speak the language of their parents, but the proper language. That That is a big part of Italian history, especially in the 20th century. Right? People in Italy, they, they lost the, the, the public use of that word um, uh, is, and even the language. So I think Nabili Don was always seen as like a, a lower caste language. And I'm pretty sure it became archaic. And a lot a big reason is because people wanted to be, you know, they wanted to raise up in class. Yeah, but I've seen a lot of evidence that actually says otherwise, which is that people held on to those regional dialects because it, it was for safety. It, it helped you like a speaking code almost like like that was your your code to people who were from the same area so where maybe they wanted to trade up in business they wanted to go from pizzeria to restaurant uh, but maybe holding on to the dialect was something kind of important in the same way that you hold on to their family recipe or any custom but yeah oh, yeah peter just mentioned uh, peter regas just chimed in over here in the chat saying that a beats was also used in chicago Oh, cool. So I would love to see like if it's on signs, like I I'm just more curious about, okay, we may never know if people spoke that the term in that way, except for from articles like you just showed us, but was, was that term used in signs? And uh, can you just speak to, just really to clear it off for everybody, can you speak to that word abits? Does it, does it refer to anything different from what we call pizza in New York? Well, it's a tough question because <laughs> pizza, uh, so generally speaking, if we're talking about a, th a thin crust pizza that we almost call neo-Neapolitan in America, it's in New York or any city, a beats and pizza in that way are the same. It's the same, 
it's the translation would be a tomato pie in Jersey and you know they southern Jersey they have a tomato pie that's the same as New Haven's tomato pie in a sense that's the translation of pizza it's translation of abits the only so things change when you're talking about the fact that pizza can also mean a pie like a pizza uh, dolce <laughs> And all of a sudden you've got a sweet pie that has nothing to do with pizza that we know. Um, and that word is used sometimes in historical records. So I think, again, it's like in New York City, if you're, if you're talking about a, what a focaccia, somebody might refer to it as a pizza, but they might not refer to it as abits. And there's well, like- That's what I love about the article you just showed, the slide before, where, uh, where it's talking about a focaccia and then it has a comma and then it says, or like otherwise known as a pizza with sauce on it. Well, like, no, you know what it's saying? It's saying even better. <laughs> they're like they're like a step up from a focaccia. Now we don't know if that the guy making that pizza in fact was making Wait, just a focaccia with sauce for a second because that, I, yeah. I I thought that slide was saying or better known as um, o per meglio dire. Doesn't that just mean like better known as? I'll take any. I'll take anyone who who want who wants to you know say that the proper way that to translate that because my my translation was like maybe not right. Um, and I I'm curious about it because it's a totally different meaning. I read that as una focaccia, like a bread, or also known as a pizza with so with tomato sauce. And, and which is interesting because then it suggests it suggests a thicker crust in that case. Um, I don't know though. I don't think it does suggest a thicker crust. Okay. Is focaccia is not necessarily thick. Okay. Focaccia could be thin. It could be thick. It could. It depends on where you're from. But so it kind of depends on who wrote that. Yeah. I, I, don't know. I just I love that whole thing. Wait, big the big question that I want to mm -hmm. get to, which a bunch of people have been kind of uh, darting around in the chat, is New Haven. We we often refer to New York style pizza. There are different formats of pizza in Chicago. There's New Haven style pizza we always talk about. How would you define New Haven style pizza? What is it about pizza in New Haven that makes it a separate species? Okay, um, I mean, New Haven style pizza is a neo-neapolitan style. It's generally speaking, it's thin crust. It's uh, crispy and chewy, traditionally baked in a brick oven with the traditional would be Coke or coal uh, doesn't have to be. And then the base would be uh, to crushed tomatoes and Pecorino Romano cheese. So that's, that is in a nutshell, a traditional New Haven pizza. Cool. Um, uh, so it's coming up in the chat. Uh, Rocco Ferraro is asking about thin focaccia. There's plenty of thin focaccia out there. Uh, the famous one that's been becoming popular more recently is focaccia de Reco. Uh, in Reco, where they'll make a, a thin dough with globs of uh, um, stracchino cheese and then mm -hmm. another thin dough on top, and that's the local focaccia. So oh. foc focaccia that's very thick uh, is focaccia genovese, or specific focaccia, but there are plenty of thin focaccia. Um, but yeah, so your description is a neo-Neapolitan, which I think just to explain to everybody, we're talking about things that are derived from Neapolitan pizza. If we want to just define pizza in, at all, we're starting in Naples. And the things that we later define as pizza are, deriv are derived from that. So when Colin's saying neo-Neapolitan, he's meaning people coming from the region of Naples, um, Amalfi, Atrani, all, you know, all these towns uh, on the coast just west of Naples, that that's where it comes in. And when you showed that map, I loved it because I'd been to Atrani, I stayed in Atrani, and it one of the most beautiful, magical places I've ever seen. It really is. Actually, right behind, where is it? Over here. That's, yeah. That's the, uh, you know, that's the cathedral in, um, in Amalfi. That's actually me and my wife. We got married there. <laughs> so I agree. It's the most beautiful, romantic place in the world. I love that. I, and that's, that's the church right there, like right when you pull yep. up on that one main road. Okay, so we got a question from, oh, Patrick Hardy is asking a question. Would this New Haven Abitz be considered actual Neapolitan style pizza rather than we, what we think of as Neapolitan pizza today? Mm. So, okay, 
um, I was having a conversation with another pizza theologian about this and there's a theory this is just you know a theory that I haven't been able to prove or but I've heard discussion about it that pizza in Naples changed and what New Haven is serving is the way that pizza used to be um, I'm not going to say all of Naples all of Campania but it's that there's a, a direct like it's a direct connection to what was being made and it hasn't necessarily changed in its style and it in its cook method um, despite, you know, that one pizza that Frank Pepe made with all the toppings on it, um, there, even, even with that five years later, his pizzas look just like our pizzas now. So yeah. I, there is a lot of questions about whether the, you know, all these ingredients, the, from the flour, the water, the oven type, the cook, the method of heating to, you know, all these, all these little innuendos and the customers yeah, but, that want to eat it. Yeah, but Colin, uh, in New Haven, there were Coke-fired ovens, and I, I, I don't know the technical specs, but Coke doesn't, doesn't get too hot. It does, certainly doesn't get as hot as a wood-fired oven. Coke gets very hot. Well, what temps are we talking about? Yeah, Coke, Coke is, a, is the byproduct, right? It's, it's, it's like a brittle brick. It's had all the gas sucked out. and it's, So everything that's ever been described about Coke is that it produced a very, very hot, dry fire, mm. like 1,000 degrees in its big, you know, ball of, of Coke uh, brick, briquettes, but that it was very hard to get going. So they'd always have to add wood to it to get, mm -hmm. you know, to get it going a lot. So that's my understanding of Coke is that it was when a very hot fire. Because now they use anthracite, right? Or do they still use Correct. Um, when, you know, Coke was made, it? Coke was made in New Haven from about 1917 to about 1965 or so by a Connecticut Coke, Copper's Coke. And they, when they went out of business, pizzerias were also being demolished by urban renewal and highway development and such. So there was a choice. Pizzerias could move and use a, a you know, gas oven. Um, and then the other choice would be that pizzerias could adopt a different type of you know, method, which was coal. And um, the two that lasted in New Haven, um, Sally's and Pepe's, they you know, still use now coal ever since the 60s. Modern, which had a coke-fired oven, uh, previously had switched over to oil. Um, they have injected oil flame into their oven. And there's a pizzeria in Meriden, Connecticut, that has, it's one of the longest running uh, bake ovens that Little I know Rondevue. of making bread or pizza. So they're, it's the Little Rendezvous, and it's like an 1888 oven that's burning you know, coal. And actually, I have an ad um, showing like who's most likely who supplied that coal or or coke. That's what um, I'm. Um, that's what I'm curious about. Uh, like, are are the is there coal now coming from? Where's I mean, it must be coming from Pennsylvania, right? Yeah. Well, Pepe's and Sally's gets it from Pennsylvania. Sometimes you see that they get it from West Virginia, but it's almost always the pallets are anthracite from West from Pennsylvania. Yeah, I'd be shocked because I don't think West Virginia has any anthracite. No. I don't think so. I think it's all bituminous. Now, my memory of listening to some of our Chicago historians was that there they would have used bituminous coal in Chicago. It, well, yeah, I mean, the, the only coal fire that's still there now uses bituminous. This is the bituminous, and then this is the anthracite. So oh, the anthracite. I've got something for you. Hold on one sec. I'm up dense. Oh, yeah, we're going to have, are we going to have showing off our rock collections? And when you come back, I got questions from Ken Forkish. Okay. Ken, we're get to your questions, buddy. Don't worry. This? Let's see. Okay, that, that's Coke. This is Coke. Yeah, with all the, the little holes in all that. So, look, here we go. <laughs> Cole Nerd says Subu. <laughs> <laughs> These are from Peppies, by the way. That's cool. So, okay, we got, we got questions for you from Ken Forkish. Um, oh, and you know what? Wait, before we get there, let's get this one. Venkat just brought this up. This question came up before and I forgot to ask it. Um, can you talk a little bit about clams? Why are they offered in all the restaurants and all the pizzerias and how did they eventually end up on pizza? Somebody else mentioned that there's, um, is, there's plenty of mythology about um, Frank Pepe adding clams onto pizza. Can you speak to why are clams used on, uh, why are clams served in New Haven and how do people think they ended up on a pizza? Sure. Okay, so clams were 
very popular uh, appetizer dish and street food. Clams on a half shell. They crack them open and you just slurp it. Probably, I mean, was there a big clamming industry right yeah. off the coast? Yeah, our, so we're on the coast of Long Island Sound and it's, the waters are full of mollusks, like full of them. So we've got, we're, we used to be an oyster harvesting city. We still are. Um, mussels, clams, oysters, they're all here. So the ones that you hear about are the certified Rhode Island clams. They're actually little neck clams. They don't have to be from Rhode Island. They could be from Brantford, Connecticut, for example. And they would be collected and brought in. And a lot of the people from Italy here were from the coastal areas. So they also were used to having seafood and, and loved that kind of food. So it became a, a continued popular dish to have. The story we have about how it became a pizza dish or a pizza topping is that if they were serving it on the half shell as an appetizer, you know, one thing could theoretically lead to the next and it just ends up on top of a pizza. Yeah. We see it on the menus. We know that Frank Pepe, the family explains that Frank Pepe was experimenting after World War II with putting the clam on a pizza and he, he, he figured it out to make a white clam pizza um, that once people, once customers started to eat it, they requested it over and over and over again. The evidence we have that he, you know, made that pizza was family tradition. Plus we now see it on the menu of the 1970s. Um, people are literally waiting in line in the 70s for white clam pizza at Pepe's. And it's, it shows up in newspaper articles and P Sally's follows suit, Modern does too. And you realize that what happens is once people saw, and, and um, in, I think it was in the 80s that Zupardi started making their white clam pizza where they freshly shucked the clam right on top of it. Mm. Um, so the, it was like one, one pizziolo would see that the other guy is doing something great and then take it, you know, kind of adopt it. Um, and then who could make the best white clam that became a way to get a new, your customers in, you know, and challenge each other. So that's my understanding of the story. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it, honestly, it all seems really clear. Uh, clams are common because they're, they're local. You're not going to find a clam pizza at that time in Nebraska. You know what I mean? Like, they're, I hope not. They're using that pizza because they're local. And how do they end up on a pizza? The same way anything ends up on a pizza. It's sitting there. Hey, why don't we try it? Uh, as you can see, chicken ended up on pizza at Sally's and at Pepe's. So uh, things certainly get kind of weird. Um, I, I do want to hit up a couple of these questions from Ken. So Ken Forkish was asking about, were they baking pizza in ovens that were designed to bake bread? Or were those ovens, like the Camposano oven, was that designed to bake pizza? Okay, great question, Ken. Um, there, as far as I can tell, all, all of these old ovens were bread baking ovens. They were entirely all designed and sold and marketed to bread bakers. Um, you know, universal oven, the Middleby oven, the Dutch County tool ovens, they're all French bread ovens and they're, they were adopted and sort of, they didn't do much to them to change them from that to a pizza oven. The only difference was that they, they used the wide peels to make sure they could fit the pizza on it. And, and I think that happened throughout the U S we didn't have pizza ovens. We had bread ovens. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, it was one of the differences in coming to this country was a different type of oven, a different type of heating source. So no, we don't, I mean, that, a pizza oven is a new concept in a lot for in New Haven. It's a new concept in the last like 20 years, 30, 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it seems similar to like in Naples, the ovens that were used to bake pizza were not necessarily designed for pizza baking. It seems that they're just, the, the dome structures could be used for anything, but the way that they were used, a continuous fire shoved off in the corner with extreme heats, that's it's a use for baking in the same way that my oven is not a pizza oven but i can use it i can crank it and i can use it to make great pizza but but yeah. i don't think the ovens in naples were being built for bread or i don't think they were being built for pizza until there's there's some day. curious things about that too because we read these articles from like you know the 1840s and 50s um talking about rows of pizzerias in naples and these little shops that were specifically only making pizza. That's what they say. It makes you wonder if obviously these ovens were adopt where again, they were adopted from and designed after a French bread oven or excuse me, um, 
a beehive oven that would bake bread in anyone's home, but that they might have been augmented in some way to make it better for pizza. I mean, I, I, I'd now, like to learn nowadays, more. Nowadays, if you're going to buy an oven for Neapolitan pizza, it's going to have a small mouth and it's going to be an arched mouth. It's not going to have straight sides and come up. It's going to be straight arch. And then the dome is going to be relatively low. The higher the dome, the uh, more gap of air you'll have on the top. So the less, mm. the lower the speed of convection. Mm. So like a Neapolitan pizza that bakes crazy fast is, won't be achieved by that super high dome. It's a lower dome. So maybe, maybe that's part of it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We, we've, I feel like we could go on for an eternity, but I do want to welcome people to ask Colin questions via his website, via Instagram, anything. Uh, but this has been tremendously interesting. Just understanding what, what the first documented pizzerias are in New Haven is really, really cool. And seeing kind of what the world was like beyond the Sally's and Peppy's thing, which of course is a huge deal today. But um, thank you for showing us all these awesome images. People can see more of this stuff in Colin's book. Um, we, uh, again, so much more detail we can go into, and I think we will. Like, Colin, I'd love to have you come back and do we'll a whole back. talk about a beats. And maybe we can even talk about pizza terminology. I would love to have you, maybe also Peter, and we could talk about signage and articles and, you know, different references and, uh, you know, terminology for it, because... I know that the, the folks in Trenton like the phrase tomato pie. They'll argue that that's a different food than pizza, even though at the end of the argument, they actually will relent and they'll just say, yeah, it's pizza. Uh, same thing with the beets. It's like, I, I actually think that the Trenton food and the New Haven food have more in common with each other than they do with New York, which mm. is just because New York pizza rolled over and became a, a, a New York slice thing, whereas what's going on in Trenton and what's going on in New Haven kind of stayed the same. So. Cool. I like anyway, it. I'll be like back. Go ahead, I'll everybody be back. Listen. Check this out. This will be posted up online soon. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Scott.